Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, just following on with the Archimedes A440 here. In the previous video, we got video working, I made my own cable there, and I sort of showed the uh, you know, pinouts and things for that, so you could perhaps do the similar thing yourself if you want to get one of these working with uh, you know, a 1084 monitor or something similar. Um, the SCART cable hopefully should arrive soon, we might be able to test that in this video to determine whether we can use this on normal TV. We also got the mouse work in the previous video, that was thanks to uh, Plan C, actually he uh, you know, previously done a mod to use an Amiga mouse so it made it super easy for me to do the same thing. I uh, also got the keyboard up and running because there were a number of problems with the keyboard, actually lots of keys weren't working and stuff. Um, so the floppy drive was okay but uh, I want to clean the heads and things. We need to deal with the battery for the CMOS because uh, you know, if you leave this off for a few hours switch it back on you start getting weird things going on, you have to clear the uh, CMOS by holding down the delete key when you power it on and then it's okay you know obviously at that point you need to add the hard disk back in again but the hard disk wasn't working when this first arrived but after it being powered up for a good 20 minutes and me cycling the power a few times and hearing it spin up and spin down or spin up spin down it started to work and it's been working reliably ever since so yeah the hard disk I think is okay but it, pr it perhaps just needs a good clean in there uh, the sound was the main thing, and I'm going to focus on that first, I think. There was no sound. We had no sound coming out of the 3.5mm uh, socket on the back, and no sound coming out of what I th think I think there should be an internal speaker. Sorry, cats are super interested here. So, we'll get the lid off and uh, have a look inside. So it looks like the three screws at the back are missing, and we've just got uh, two screws on the side here. So we'll get these out, and then hopefully the lid should slide off. And just so you know what I'm talking about, there should be three screws here I think, but the lid then slides all the way back. And we're in there, so it looks in pretty good condition actually. Uh, I mean the first thing that uh, is clearly visible, let's look at this disintegrating, the, uh, there should be a protective uh, cover, a uh, filter for the fan, and it's disintegrated. I'll show you that in a sec, you can't quite see it, it's off shot there. Uh, so we've got a VLSI chip down here, I'll have a look at that in a minute, I'm not sure uh, what's what, I think the ARM processor might be down here, I'm not sure it's going to be a large chip I would think, or it might not be, it might be one of these. They have a Western Digital floppy controller on these as well, is it a WD1772 or something? Something like that. Um, so you can uprate, you know, and then put an Ajax chip on there or something that'll run twice the clock speed. You probably need a mod or something there to feed that clock to it and stuff and switch between high density and double density there, but you can do that. You can see the four ROMs here, so I've got uh, Risk OS. you can hear the chip creep there, it's worth pushing these down because you get that where they slide out the sockets. Uh, yeah, this has uh, got Risk OS 3.10, early versions are something called Arthur. Um, I'm not sure whether they're different versions of Arthur, I think following Arthur came Risk OS 2, and then you got 3, 3.1, 0, 3.11, and then, I don't know, Risk 4 upwards, I think, I think there's a version 4. I think there's a 3.7 actually, there might not be a 4, and there's a 3.7 because I've been using that on a strong arm emulator. So you can see the 3.5 inch drive here, the floppy, uh, another VLSI chip there. So we've got our MFM drive here, I'm not sure, well, I think it is, it could be RLL. Um, the difference is, I think uh, RLL allowed higher, um, uh, you know, larger capacity drives, like slightly larger. I think the compression was better, or the encoding or something was optimised over MFM. Um, but the two are kind of sort of interchangeable in the sense that if you've got an MFM controller, uh, it will work with an RLL drive, but you won't get the full capacity. Um, and uh, this, the opposite is sort of true as well, you know, you can use an RLL controller with an MFM drive but you'll only get the capacity of the MFM uh, drive if you see what I mean. Another key thing to point out while we're here, you can see these four connections here, these are for what they call podules. So that was the ACORN terminology for, you know, a module that you could just plug into a system and it would, you know, bring you some additional functionality. So kind of think of these as like an ISA slot in uh, one of the old PCs, you know, it's expandability, you could stick a uh, MIDI interface in here, uh, an IDE podule, uh, maybe a RAM podule, etc, etc. So looking in the fan area, you're not going to be able to see this particularly well, but yeah, the fan should have a filter on top of it, and it's just crumbled, but then also we've got, what's this here, it's just like a pin header that's floating around, and this here, what on earth's that? Some sort of battery module or something, I don't know, I don't know what that is. I honestly haven't got a clue, it goes to the fan. 
must be a fan controller or something. It's weird how it's got this sticky tape and a thing around it. Is that a mod or something? What are these connectors here for? I don't know, that's very strange. Um, and then the battery bay here, that's probably going to need replacing, I think, or at least cleaning up because the contacts look a bit corroded. But this is primarily why, in the previous video, we were getting problems where if you left it switched off for a few hours, switched it back on, it behaved really strangely. Sometimes it would just go straight to the supervisor prompt, etc. And you had to hold down delete to, you know, reinitialize the CMOS uh, settings and things because it's not got these batteries here. So, yeah, we need to do some work there as well. So something else interesting, I've just noticed, this leads to the speaker. I had a quick look under here, there's the speaker. And one of the LEDs, maybe for the hard disk access light. So I never noticed that, actually. I think there is supposed to be an LED on the front for the hard disk activity. So, yeah, we'll reconnect that. I'm just going to go plug it back in and power it up, just to see if that makes any difference to the speaker sound. Um, it may well be that there's just something wrong with the 3.5mm socket on the back. Maybe we do have sound. Um, so, yeah, I'll do that next. So it's booting again. Oh, we had sound. Well, wow. well, that's strange. Strange how we're not getting any sound out of the uh, headphone socket, but nevertheless, yeah, we are getting sound now. I wonder if the hard disk activity light's working. Yeah, so if I go into a folder on the hard disk, did you see that flicker there? Then let's do it again and again. Sweet. So a quick update from the previous video, you can see my uh, D-type housings arrived, so yeah, <laughs> that is the shortest adapter ever, I really should have gone with, you know, a cable about that long or something, uh, but it works and I've strained it out now, so you plug it in, you know, your uh, mouse just goes in there, and you can see the one for the uh, video here, again, uh, looks nice and tidy. Um, I'm going to stick some stickers on here, just for now I've just written a, a red A on there, just so I know that's the Archimedes end, because obviously these are exactly uh, the same there. Hopefully the SCART cable will arrive, and I'll show that within this video as well. So, I've got no idea about how to best to disassemble this. Uh, the first thing I'll point out, you can see the power connectors here, we've got yellow and a black, and on the other side I think it says 12 volts on the actual silk screen and... Uh, ground so you've got to make sure you don't think this is the 12 that's the ground make sure that when you disconnect these uh, the spade connectors should just pull off like that they're a bit stiff uh, yeah make sure you get them the right way around or it's game over uh, really so I think if we remove the screws here we'll get the podgeable bay out if we can first there's one on each side of there there might be another power connector yet on there for 5 volts there must be in fact, yeah, you can see the 5 volt one down there. It's uh, not that easy to get to, but nevertheless, it's there. And moving the camera around, you can see this whole thing is plugged into the motherboard there, and then it detaches. So that's quite nice, you can dust that. It's pretty clean, actually. So we'll disconnect the power to the floppy drive here, if we can. Just pull it off. And you can see the ARM CPU there, actually. It's uh, marked uh, ARM just there. Can you see where my nail is? And we'll disconnect the uh, floppy drive as well. You can see, can you see that there? That's been pulled before, somebody's pulled that before. You've got to be careful when you're detaching these, but yeah, that has been off in the past at some point. Can you see that? That's quite loose. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure what I might be able to do with that. I don't know, I might be able to just reclip it back over there. It might have just come unhooked. Um, anyway, that's that. Somehow I've got to get this drive bay out as well. I do see screws down there. Uh, I'm not sure whether you need to remove the front. You may well have to remove this front piece to get access to that. Uh, I'm going to need to do that anyway to get to the motherboard because you know it goes right under there to the front. I'm going to have to swap some more screws on this. You see that screw there? That was the one that was in here uh, on this side. And that's the one that they're supposed to have. Look at the thread. It's completely different. And it was in to about that height there. It was just stuck up like that, you know, uh, that height. So yeah, someone's used the wrong screws. That looks like one of the screws for the case, actually. So now we've done that, I think the drive might move back. I'm not sure. It's kind of tilted upwards, so it does look like you need to take the front off, actually. Can you see this? I've just uh, pointed it around here. Can you see it's kind of like it's, put, it's slanted upwards ever so slightly? So you're not going to be able to just pull it straight back. That's a bit stupid. So there's a screw on that side, a screw on the other side, one under here, underneath, and one on the other corner. And then the front, as you can see, is coming off, uh, along with the drive. So bear in mind, you've got uh, these things here to disconnect. So we can disconnect the speaker and hard disk activity light again. 
Uh, it's one of those where you've got to, can you see it? If you look at the little red piece of plastic down there, it's got little flaps, so you need to stick a screwdriver in as you pull it upwards. Yeah, so you've got the remnants of the old filter in here, and it's all over the board and everywhere. So the driver's come out now, it's a Citizen, as you can see here, I think. Oh, mind you, that might just be the motor. Um, I think Citizen made floppy drives though, so yeah, I think it's a Citizen drive actually. So we'll get the hard disk out now. It's actually a Toshiba. That screw came out okay. One on the other side. And we'll do the same thing over here, just disconnect these two connectors. One's like the data connector and one's the control. I think it should be power. Yeah, it's just a standard Molex here, look. Like you're getting a PC. And there's the drive. So, uh, yeah, we'll inspect that. There might be some uh, electrolytics that need swapping out on there. The drive may perform better when it's had that done. Yeah, there's a few, quite low profile ones on it. Weighs quite a bit that actually. But you can see it's a Toshiba here, manufactured in Tokyo, Japan. And the model number there, MK134FA. Um, now these old drives, they used to have this table here of bad, you know, defective tracks, or bad sectors. Interestingly there's nothing marked on this, so this obviously was perfect from uh, manufacture. But there are some bad sectors on here, I'll show you a bit later. Um, so yeah, it perhaps needs reinitialising I think. And any bad sectors, you know, that have now the drive now has added on there. Uh, I mean, it might be game over for the drive. I don't know, but I am going to get an IDE module for this, and I'll connect up a compact flash card, and I'll leave this drive in as well, and we'll just see if we can maybe at that point it reinitialise it or something. And I never noticed that when we looked at earlier at the speaker area. Did you see the two pieces of blue tag? <laughs> Someone's put that there, and I think that was where the fan controller was stuck on. So you can see how mucky this area is. Now I previously cleaned up the contacts here with the, the wire brush actually in the battery bay. It's not too bad. We'll have a closer look at that in a minute, but you can see it's riveted on. There's rivets there. The interesting thing with this here, let me show you this. This is crazy. I think this is a third party bodge here. We have a piece of wood under the fan there, supporting it up. Uh, and it's got this string around it. Can you see this? This like string through all the holes go all the way around there. Someone's tied it on. It's tied onto the case. Is that factory? <laughs> that can't be factory. Surely it had bolts or something through it. You can see what a mess this is making though. This is black spongy stuff just going everywhere. Now the interesting thing here is this massive piece of metal here. It's welded on. You know, you can see it's welded and, well, riveted at least to the chassis on both sides. So you cannot remove that. So the only way you could get the board out, presumably, is to slide it. And it looks like that's how it's held in. Can you see down here? It's like a plastic slider thing. You know, a, a clip, if you like, to hold the edge of the board. It holds it underneath. It holds it like, like that kind of thing from each side. So it looks like it slides out. I'm not seeing any screws at this point. So, oh yeah, you'd have to remove the nuts and stuff from the back there, I think. Oh, what a pain. But I'm guessing at that point it will then just slide backwards out of the machine. Now I could be wrong there, I'm going to take a gamble and I'm going to unscrew these screws here, I think if I can, and I'm going to try and slide it out the back, you know, then it could leave everything connected because that seems more logical. They might have just like made it as a little panel here so you can slide the whole board out, bear in mind you need to have disconnected any uh, cables and interconnects and all that. Um, oh yeah, hang on. I think, I'm not sure what's holding it. Yeah, we've got a ground wire here. I'm not sure where that's going. It's underneath here somewhere. I can't... Oh, it's soldered onto the thing there. So yeah, we could disconnect that there. But then, oh, what's holding it now? Oh, obviously these need disconnecting as well. Uh, and if we just carefully disconnect these black, red, God, these are well stuck on there. 12, yeah, that's right. And that one's going to be minus 5, is it? Just like you get on a BBC. So I think we'll need to disconnect these as well, actually, because they're, they're not going to go through the hole very well, are they? If we just uh, stick those over there, just gently pull those off. So we'll just gently pull those two off as well. Now they are keyed, so you can't really get those the wrong way around, I don't think. Yeah, I think the reason it's stuck now, we have a screw there. 
I think. That might be stopping it. Can you see that if I move that look? It's hitting that screw. So there's a screw underneath to remove as well. It's a bit odd. And there was another one under there as well. This is a bit of a crazy design. I like the idea of being able to get the board out from the back this way, I think. But still, uh, it's a bit of a pain. So I just need to undo that uh, nut there, actually. For that ground connection. So I've got the board out. The uh, first interesting thing is the RAM here is uh, the zip type zigzag interleaved package, I think. So you've got uh, you know two rows there and the kind of uh, interleaved in terms of the alignment. Um, so some of these aren't very straight, but yeah, that's four megs worth of those. It's a lot of chips, isn't it? I suspect they're quite hard to find as spares. Those actually got a large 42 pin or is it 44 pin oh it's like 44 pin to me actually uh, chip there I'll have a look at that in a sec uh, a bit of chip creep going on I think on this chip here we need to push that back in so there are actually three of those chips of that size we've got one down here what's that that's Arabella yeah so that one's Arabella yeah, so this one down here is your memory controller. It's marked Mem C1A, I think. Uh, now, from memory, uh, I was reading some articles on how you can upgrade the RAM on these beyond 4 meg, and uh, Acorn designed it in such a way that you would need to link up more of these memory controllers. So you can have four of these communicating together, linked in some sort of way, to give you up to a theoretical 16 meg. Um, but yeah, so you need one of those if you're going to go beyond. 4 meg and in fact some of the earlier versions I think are limited to 1 meg and there was an early version of this uh, memory controller here that was a bit flaky uh, I'm, not, can't, I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what was wrong with it but uh, yeah there was so it is pretty dusty uh, I'm definitely going to have to dust this so we've got the RISC uh, OS ROMs here I think I'm going to swap those out with 3.11 actually it's got 3.10 at the moment and as I said a few minutes ago, there's our ARM processor there. So that's your ARM 2 CPU. Again, looking very dusty. And probably needs just pushing back in a little bit because of chip creep. So there's a lot of uh, HC uh, logic on here. You know, 7.4 series chips. 7.4 HCT 573s. 373s. Uh, what's that? 3.74 down there. That's interesting. That's a 6.5S. C51. Uh, is that some sort of UR or something? I'm not sure. Yeah, more 74 series there, 245s, 74AC11, I think. Uh, that's an AM26 LS31. Um, there's our floppy controller. It's a VLSI branded, but it's a 1772-02 PC. So yeah, you can swap that out for you know a faster one like an Ajax. They'll do up to uh, you know do HD discs. I'm not sure what this is down here. Is this the CMOS SRAM? Perhaps it's an IC. It's right next to the battery connector. So I think it could be. That might be what that is. Got a PAL down here. And of course the concerns with PALs is a bit like the custom chips, if it um, fails you could be in a mess unless someone's got the you know equations for that so you could reprogram um, a replacement. So we've got a couple of uh, what look like op-amps down here, an LM386, yeah that's, that's an op-amp for sure, related to the sound output, and an LM324, is that an op-amp? I think it might be, uh, it might be a comparator or something, I'm not sure. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, more 74 series. Yeah, I think these AM26 uh, LS32s here. I think that's a line driver, and we've got an AM LS, uh, and we've got an AM26 LS30. That's a line driver. I think one's receive, one's transmit. I think they're kind of like the 1488 and 1489 chips you get on uh, Amiga boards and ST boards and even Spectrums and things like that. You know, just to uh, control your serial um, output and input and stuff. Where's the serial port? Yeah, the serial port's there. So it's kind of like right right next to the serial port. So I'm guessing that's what those are. Lots of transistors here, uh, presumably for your uh, video output and stuff, actually, because that's right next to the video port. Sorry, it's a off shot a little bit there. 
so we've got jumpers and things on this board as well. You can see some there. Uh, there's one or two here and a few other locations on the board you know to configure this for example one of the things you can do and it might be this back block here with these ROMs here you can alter these jumpers to dictate whether you're using uh, a mask ROM like this or an EEPROM actually because the pinout's subtly different I was looking at using 27C040 uh, chips for this and the majority of the pins are correct apart from one of the upper uh, address bits I think is swapped with a chip select or something or an output enable uh, but I think using these jumpers here you can actually fix that you can change that so you would be able to use I think that chip on there uh, it's really dusty this anyway I'm going to vacuum this up next I think So while we're here, I'll give the battery contacts another clean, but as I say, I did give them a clean before. You can see that one there is super clean. This one, can you tell it's a little bit corroded, but not a massive amount. Uh, I got the actual green bits off there with the wire brush earlier, actually. And I've tested the battery uh, fit in here does work, you know, put the batteries in, it holds time and date and the settings and things. I'll go over that with a fiberglass pen in a minute, but you know, you, the actual hold was okay. There's a few bits, can you see here, on the chassis? that just need uh, a little scratch I think again I might have to go over them with the uh, fiberglass pen there but if we could just get the surface corrosion off so that it's not red, you can see most of that's come off there just bits, bits of red dust now yeah that's not too bad and we've got a little bit there as well yeah not sure how well you'll be able to see that but I've cleaned them with a bit of sandpaper as well so you know they're totally smooth now they look a bit of a funny colour but I've also wiped over with some cotton buds and uh, vinegar actually and then finally I'm just going to go over these with some uh, IPA but as you can hear smooth and slippery you know it's not sticking um, to the bits of corrosion you know the corrosion has all gone and we'll just clean this up here but I did give this a little clean earlier on it was quite clean actually the bay there it was just the contacts that were uh, a bit dirty yeah, again you're probably not going to be able to see it but can you hear super smooth so yeah the corrosion has definitely come off them and it, it seemed to be the positives I think or was it the negatives the negatives yeah the negative sides both got corroded up the positives didn't and that's typically what happens with these things actually you find that it's uh, usually the negative side that gets corroded up so the final thing we'll do is just bend those contacts up just a little bit on each side uh, the ones on that side are okay but the ones on this side just look like they've been bent inwards just a little bit there we go that should do it now i think with regards to the power supply i'm going to look at that in a later video i'll do it in its own right i think if i'm going to recap that and inspect it it's probably okay but uh, yeah we will go in there at some point i'm just not going to do it in this video because we've just got so much uh, you know so many of the things i want to cover in this video i guess So the board's had a clean, something I'd point out, we're talking about the fuse on 4000s, see that there, FS1, right next to the keyboard connector here. So these have got a fuse as well actually. One of the stickers has come off here, can you see this uh, thing here was stuck here around the vid C area. So I'll just stick a tiny bit of double sided tape on the back of that, just stick it back down. So it's had a quick vac and then a clean with some cotton buds. Um, the other thing, Econet, look, the port's there, even though it's, uh, you know, it's covered up on the back there there is actually a port. I'm guessing the Econet module perhaps plugs in here between these two connectors. Um, please post in the comments below, but I suspect so. Um, I'll see if I can get an Econet module for this, I think, at some point. I might just stick that down with a little bit of double-sided tape there on both sides as well, because it'll just fall off eventually, and it is a piece of history for the board, probably related to quality control checks and things like that. Uh, anyway, I think we'll get the board back into the case now. So I'll just carefully slide the board back in. If you're going to work on a system like this, make sure you're wearing an ESD wrist strap, which I am not actually just at the moment. I was when I was handling it a minute ago, but uh, just now, because of lack of space, I've had to just take it off. So I've got the uh, ground connection back onto the chassis there, and we've screwed the two screws in on the sides. I just need to do the two that are under here. There's one there and one here somewhere, I think in the middle. Yeah, where my fingers are there. Yeah, you can see better from here, that's one. 
so I think we'll get the uh, battery connector plugged back in while we can there. This fan controller is a bit strange. I'm suspecting that that normally goes straight to the board here. I'm just not sure why we've got another thing coming off here. That almost suggests to me you can have a second fan somewhere inside here. And I'm not sure what these are. Can you see this? Uh, see if we can focus. It's just like, I don't know, the heat shrunk over. I don't know what those are. Capacitors or something inside maybe? I don't know. What are they? I ain't got a clue. Why does it even need this? I don't know. And we need to reconnect these, so I'll start with a minus five at the back, and as I say, it's marked on the PCB. If you look at the silk screen, it's actually marked minus five. Just make sure that's on firmly, with the one up here is plus twelve, which is the yellow. And a plus five, which is the red. Uh, ground. So we'll just get our connectors for our floppy and hard disk back on. Uh, you can see there's a piece cut out there. That's intentional, you know, they've done that at manufacture. There's no twists in it though. Yeah. And again, you can't get these wrong round the wrong way because they are keyed. As you can see, you know, if you look at that there, can you see that plastic notch? So you can only get it one way into the connector because there's a little gap for that uh, key there. Yeah, I think that's for a second hard disk actually there. I'm not sure because it's the same as this one here. And I think, I vaguely remember with these type of hard disks, these ST506s, you have um, one control signal here and I think you can have the two separate data things for the different drives. And I think while we're here, we'll just remove the hard disk from this cradle. Uh, I'll get these bits of blue tack off here as well because this, this that serves no purpose at all, it just looks a mess. As well as examine it, I can clean underneath there as well. Yeah, it looks okay, I don't see any bad connections or anything. Um, I mean the solder looks a bit questionable, just in one or two places on one or two of those quad flat packs, but uh, yeah, I mean I'll inspect it super close. I don't see anything I need to do there. These types of caps generally probably won't need to swap it out on this drive. But I have seen some of these old MFM and RL drives where the caps uh, are often the problem. Quantum drives are a good example. You can get quantum drives where it'll spin up and spin down, spin up, spin down. And often it's uh, SMD caps and you just replace them. Uh, or not SMD caps, but um, capacitors on those quantum drives. You swap them out and uh, generally it'll solve it. Uh, well, not always. You know, there are lots of instances where it solves it though. The other thing that's interesting, you can see this here, this little contact, is a ground contact for the centre of the spindle, you know, uh, where it rotates. Look at the size of that, that's really super beefy, that. That's kind of like your H-bridge driver, you know, for controlling the um, spindle and the probably the airheads as well, I would think, maybe not. There's perhaps not enough quick connections on there for everything, but yeah, look how beefy that is. Obviously it's going to sink a lot of current, that, because uh, obviously, the you know, it's a fair bit of weight around the rotation of the um, platters there. Yeah, resistors. Sometimes, like I said, on some of the drives, these resistors can fail. Um, they can sort of break down a little bit, so they're not completely open circuit, uh, and th that can sometimes cause you a problem. But I'm not experiencing any, any issues with this drive now other than a few bad sectors on it, which I think I need to deal with. I mean, there might be quite a lot of bad sectors yet. I don't know. All the stuff that's on there I can read. I have written a load of stuff to it, but then it got to the point where, I, if I try and write something to it now, I keep getting this bad sector in the same spot. And obviously, if I delete that file and then put another one, I'm trying to put it in the same place, I think. Um, so yeah, we can perhaps have a look at that after to see if there's anything I can do about that. So the other thing we need to do here is have a look at the floppy drive. So I'll get the screws out from the uh, bracket here, and we'll take a look at that. So pointing to the left, I'll put that over there. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like a TIAC, this. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's Citizen, can you see that there? It's an OSDC-65C. But it's, uh, yeah, it looks very similar to uh, either a Panasonic or, or something like that, I think. There we go. So, yeah, not dissimilar to uh, any other drive you've seen. I've still got a disc in there, actually. So you can see some dirt on this uh, worm gear thing here. Uh, worm bar, call it what you want. Um, do you know, it looks almost identical to one of the Panasonic models, this. It really does. Just inspecting around to see if there's any uh, capacitors. There is, there's one here. But we do know this drive works okay. 
So yeah, just bear in mind, you might need to swap out the odd cap on these. There's probably some more on the underside. I think it's suspect if you pull this board off, there might be one or two under there. Although it doesn't look like it, to be fair. And you could easily add a second drive here. You can see the drive ID switch there, a little switch on the back you could use to toggle. There's a few jumpers down there as well. But I suspect you could probably put a PC720K floppy drive in and it would work fine. So we'll collect all the dust out of the mechanism with the cotton buds. Uh, well, with a bit of IPA in there as well. You can see it is a bit dirty in there actually. And uh, literally from everywhere, you want to go all around this, get all of the dust and fluff out of it. It's perhaps one of the harder drives to get access to all the areas in here because of the massive amount of metal work around there. But yeah, if you spend some time, you can get into all the nooks and crannies to get any bits of dust out. And we'll clean that grease off there and I'll get a bit of mollycott on there, I'll be fine. Uh, you want uh, like a silicon or lithium based grease probably for something like that, but mollycock will do the job just as well. So in terms of cleaning the heads, if this was not working I would use some uh, Plastex on there as well. You can pull the head quite a long way up on this actually before it feels like it's uh, going to cause you an issue, but can you see that? You can put a fair bit of pressure onto these. I had someone saying, oh don't press on, press on 3.5, uh, three and a half inch drives uh, this way. But you can, you just don't need to, you know, you don't want to deform it or, you know, whatever uh, it's attached to, you don't want to cause any damage there or bend it out of position. But you still can put a reasonable amount of pressure so that it makes that squeaky noise like that and it will be fine. And don't forget to do the other head, and this one's the super hard one. This is the one I wouldn't put too much pressure on because it's quite hard um, to hold it in place and you could easily bend it or, you know, move it on its mount there. And like all floppy drivers, you've got these little switches, can you see down there, you know, for your uh, right protection, you'll have one for the HD, if you've got identity drive, you'll have one over here to set with its HD or uh, uh, double D, you know, double density. And the disc change, you know, on some systems, one of those there will be the disc, in fact there's probably two there, one of them is the disc change, you know, and if that's not working it won't detect when there's a disc in, you might think there's no disc in just because the switch is not working. So you could get some contact cleaner into the little switches and things there as well when you serve it in something like this. So we'll get a tiny bit of uh, molly cut onto the bar here. On some of these you can move the head up and down, but yeah, I mean, that'll do. Once I've seeked up and down the disc a few times, that will work its way in, that's all that's required. So I'll reassemble that now. So the screw that was down here I found a replacement for. It's got black coating, but it's exactly the same size as the one on the other side, it's just black. Um, which means it's screwed in properly because well, it's not tightened up yet, I need to get the front on and then I can tighten it up. But the one that was in there, like I say, it's not the right thread and it was, wouldn't go into the hole. Someone's tried to stick the wrong screw in there previously. I'll find some way to secure this. I'll perhaps clean all this sticky stuff off here, stick a double-sided pad and then stick it on the side of the drive or something like that. That'll hold that in place. So then once you've got the front secured on, you can then align your drive. Can you see it's stuck out a bit here? So I can just uh, strain it up a little bit. Uh, and then tighten it up inside the system to make sure it's uh, nice and flat. So I've got a thin sliver of double-sided tape on there, and I'm just going to stick that back down. I think it was kind of like in this position, somewhere down there like that. Yeah, so the fan would have originally had bolts, I've confirmed that. So yeah, this string used to hold it in here is not correct, but you know what? It's in place, it's not going to come loose, so for the moment I'm going to leave that as it is. So you can see I've got the batteries in there now, uh, positive down this end and positive up there on the left one. Uh, so it should hold the settings now I think between power cycles. So with the fan control here I've got a double sided uh, like scotch pad, you know it's quite a thick tho foamy sort of thing. And I'm going to peel that off and I'm just going to mount it on here actually in this gap. But if you know more about that please, uh, you know, again post in the comments below. I'm curious to understand if that's like a factory thing, you know, why has it got those two black wires coming off it? So I'm going to go back inside there in a bit. You can see I put these uh, new screws on the back here. And in the first video, you may have spotted those in the point on the point where I was showing you around the back. I'd already put them in at that point actually, so they weren't missing when it came. Uh, but we'll just clean over this with some IPA, see if we can get any of these marks off. They may well be chips and scratches and things on the paint, I'm not sure. A lot of them are not coming off to me. Yeah, so the IPA wasn't cutting it, but I've got some plastics on here. And see these marks here? The IPA 
was doing nothing but just uh, watch on. Can you see? It's just bringing those marks off totally. Yeah, so you can see that. Like I said, the IPA didn't make a single dint. Look at that. Those ones there have gone. Yeah, it's brilliant stuff, this, for cleaning things like this. Perfect. So there we go, all cleaned up. The grey mark was over here. I had to use some acetone to remove that. But I think you'll agree, that's come out really well, actually. So some parts have arrived. I've ordered some Risk OS 3.11 ROMs. Uh, now, I think these are OTP chips by the looks of things and someone's like labelled them up. Uh, it looks that way to me. Um, I could have used some EPROMs, but uh, they've taken ages to come from China, and I thought, well, these were only like, uh, I think it was 20 quid. Could have got them from £10 straight from the website. I'll post some links down below. Um, but yeah, we'll install those, and I think that's needed actually 3.11 for this ZIDE uh, pod, uh, pod jewel. So this is going to plug into one of the pod jewel slots there. You can see I've got uh, an IDE uh, to compact flash adapter here, super cheap. Um, I did test that, that works okay. And uh, just a small 128 meg card, but this will go up to pretty big cards, I think, 250 gig, um, as far as I understand. Obviously, you know, you'd have to petition it a fair bit, but uh, I figure we'll give that a go. And I might need a ribbon, obviously, because there's going to be uh, an issue fitting this inside there at the moment, so I might have to go and find a cable. You can see actually there's a bit of flux on the inside of there. These are, you know, obviously handmade by someone. Um, and again, I'll post some links down below. I'll talk about uh, the seller of that a little bit later on. So I've got the software on a floppy for this and you get a, a customised version of H-Form that you can use to format this and I've had to extract extract that. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I've used an emulator to do that and I would suggest that if you're going to get an Archimedes like this you want to set up an emulator before you do anything and use the emulator to actually help you with certain aspects of this. So what I mean by that is like the H-Form driver that was provided for this comes in a zip now you can't just unzip it and copy it to a floppy and stick it onto your Archimedes. You've got to actually unzip it on an Archimedes to stick it on an ADF, you know, a disk image. Write the disk image using Omniflop to then stick that in the Archimedes. You know, you could perhaps jump through some hoops if you've got a GoTech drive, but, but anyway, I'll cover some of that stuff, let's say, a bit later on. So looking at the chips there, I can see 41, 42, 43, 44 numbers on top there. And those correspond to the numbers on here, 41, 42, 43, 44. So I'll just use, uh, so I use my dip extract here and try and carefully remove these. I don't really like using dip extractor on chips like this actually. In fact, I'm going to swap to a screwdriver. So I swapped the ROMs over. Now the easy way to do it was to get the screwdriver under the edge there, just to leave it up a little bit. And then use this cheap dip extractor and just lift, you know, pull very carefully and uh, they came out okay so I've got no bent pins or anything and they all went in okay so I'm going to go power that up and just check it's on 3.11 now so the next thing we'll do here is uh, plug the uh, pod jewel in um, my cap might be in the way there actually let's just see if we can get that in yeah and they can only go one way up because these connectors are kind of keyed now bear in mind this is not going to fit in like this with the lid so I will need to get a cable for this I've got one somewhere but yeah we'll deal with that in a minute so this is connected the right way, you can only have it one way, it's keyed. Uh, and it's keyed on both sides, so again, you know, just be mindful of that though if you plug plugging a ribbon in. Certainly with the smaller connector there, you can see that's not keyed, so you could get it the wrong way around, but I, I'm 100% certain that that's absolutely right now. So we'll go and plug this in and uh, see what happens. I've got no idea what I need to do to install this. Uh, I've got a new mouse as well, which I'll show you in a minute. It's severely yellowed, but it's a proper mouse, so I'm quite pleased with that. And it was only fifteen pounds. Um, sorry, I forgot to the uh, existing hard disk. And as I say, there's some bad sectors on this hard disk, so I only just managed to get this uh, Zide H form version on here. Now, what was happening before when you ran it here? Uh, did I double tap that? I'm not sure. I don't think I did. It came up saying SWI not found or something when there was no, you know, podule in there. Now that's there. It's actually a different message. It's saying no hard disk is configured space or click to continue so i'm guessing we need to go into configure and there's different ways of doing this you could get a command prompt up in fact i'll show you that actually if we just do um, commands is it and then you can see the little bar down the bottom there and we can just do configure there's lots of shortcuts and uh hang on yeah that's not what i want to do actually yeah i need to go away and read the instructions now to work out how on earth you're supposed to install the darn thing
was a bit of a nightmare to get it working actually. You can see what I'm doing here now, I'm just copying all the files from the old uh, ST506 hard disk there onto the new drive. And uh, it is finding some bad sectors in the data there as it's going along. But And this is all someone's financial data actually, I will delete this in a minute. I'm just copying across everything anyway and I'll just show you. But what, the reason I want to do this quickly is that I can format the old drive actually. Um, so uh, let's just skip, I'm skipping any of these that don't come across. It's only the few games and I think they're all okay as far as I can see. It's just this data, you know, it's getting stuck on personal data here. So just formatting the old hard disk there with uh, an old version of H-Form. You can see that we've got some defects. Um, I've set this to like verify as it's going along and stuff. I'm not sure if it's going to flag these defects as it does the initialize here, you know, telling it to initialize. Uh, so we'll see, we'll just see what happens. But you know, there are periods of time here where it's flying along for a while without any issues at all, so it's not like the whole disk is knackered, but it'd just be nice trying, uh, if we can, format this and maybe get this drive up and running. I'll leave it in there um, for historic reasons, I guess. We've got the IDE drive now anyway. But yeah, there are some bad sectors. So that drive uh, deteriorated, actually. After formatting it, it, just, it was just flying up with errors, actually. So, uh, yeah, it was on its way out. It's a good job I replaced it, and I just replaced it just in time. Uh, I managed to copy off something like 96 or 97% of the stuff that was on it. There was just a few of like personal account details and things that didn't copy across, which ultimately I'm going to delete anyway, but we'll have a delve into that in a minute. It's always interesting to see uh, what other people have used a computer for uh, without giving away any personal... Uh, data and stuff and then we'll just zap it when we're done and I'll just uh, you know keep the games and utilities and stuff on there so bear in mind when you go inside a drive like this you want to do it in a clean room actually you know you want a, at least a, like a, quite a large hood with a vacuum there to uh, suck any particles you don't want dust getting in there at all because when it flies around at high speed you know as the drive rotates as the disc spins it bounces off the uh, surface then you get damage to the disc so yeah this is never going to work well it's never going to work again anyway I don't think um, but I mean what else are you going to do you know I think ultimately it needs new discs I think the heads are okay I think what's happened here is the uh, disc has aged you know um, they, they don't last forever any mag magnetic media uh, you can see I've got a warranty seal here I think that needs removing but I think that should come off now, I'll just uh, see if I can get the lid off. Yeah, and there you go, and you can see the problem. So there's a few issues with this actually. Can you see first of all the colour? Here, you've got like a colour change. It would have originally probably been a linear sort of brown or reddy colour across the whole span there. And also, can you see if you look close, can you see the little marks of dirt? Uh, yeah, look at that there, can you see that? So yeah, we've got a lot of wear there, look at that, black spot. So, you know, I could be daring and try and clean this. <laughs> uh, some of it, you know, if you just gently touch some of this with a cotton bud, you may find that some of it comes off. Um, but ultimately, this is why these die, you know, the magnetic media here, it's, uh, it wears, you know, and obviously you've got friction from the heads as well. The other interesting thing here, can you see the heads are out? That's a precarious uh, situation you would want the heads parked and that is uh, with these old drives I don't even want to try and move that actually with these old drives there's a park utility usually um, I think there's on this I think you can dismount it and I think that basically parks the heads you know it puts the head over here somewhere perhaps um, so that when you're moving it you know your head's not making contact with the disc you know, a slight knock and stuff while this is going around obviously causes problems as well. And can you see, it's kind of like pitted. There's like little marks in the surface there. And of course, you know, the head is going to catch on those and it chips bits off and you can damage the heads and stuff. So ultimately, you know, that's what's happened with this. It's, it has come to the end of its life. It was uh, a bit of a miracle it started working uh, right at the start here. You know, it was described as not even spinning up. Well, it was spinning up and spinning down, spinning up and spinning down. Um, it's uh, yeah, as I say, it's a miracle we managed to get any data off it, but uh, yeah, it's a shame really. I think that's a piece of silica gel or something there. I don't know. It could be something to collect dirt. I don't know what's that. Look, 
this little piece of foam that just goes in there that might attract particles and things, I don't know. But it could also be a piece of silica gel to keep any kind of moisture out of here at all. But nevertheless, you know, you can see that has aged. And it's probably from friction more than anything. But if you look on Wikipedia, for example, you'll find on magnetic media, it's got a finite lifespan, even when you're not using it. So it's kind of suffered an old age fatigue, this probably, but also wear. It's interesting now that you've got that coloured band in the middle there, which would suggest that, uh, you know, that area's had an awful lot more activity than the outside of the disc. I'm tempted to actually just plug this in now and uh, try it without the top on. Uh, well, not look anywhere near it, because obviously anything flies off, I could get blinded, but I might just do that just so you can see it, and we'll perhaps even try and park the heads actually, just to see if that still works, that functionality. There you go, so I don't say I don't share interesting things with you. Yeah, the interesting thing is, it's on the outside, it seems to struggle on. I said that. It's doing something. But anyway, you can see what's going on there. And in fact, it looks like the parking area is on the inside here. I've just worked that out, I think. I think that might be why well, that's a different colour. It might not necessarily be worn. Because it's got, I think that's got automatic parking. You saw the head fly across there, watch when it gets up to speed. It's going to, when it gets initialised, I think it'll shoot off out here. Yeah, so I think that that's perhaps the parking area there. But I can't do anything with this. I mean, if I go into the HD format, I appreciate you can't see this. We're going to Utilities. Uh, this is on the other hard disk, by the way. And I'm going to HD Form. It says which drive for, it says this drive is an ST506 and then it just sits there and does nothing. So as you can see, I got it up and running on the TV, I'll cover that in the next video. If we go into info, you can see it did successfully upgrade to 3.11 with the ROMs there. I hope you found the video interesting, please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video.